let me remind that the motor, the motorboat had two side wheels that you must leave at three, four years old. <laughs> and they lo and it lost with Valentino. Valentino won easily. So it, there is a lot to go in it. <laughs> Just to, you know, don't touch Valentino. <laughs> so I will talk about cardiac fluid dynamics. That is something completely different, completely new in some sense, because what I, I work, my job is to do something that will be normal, hopefully, in, in a few years. So for research, maybe this is, it is good to know this. So I will talk a little bit about what is fluid dynamics and cardiac fluid dynamics, and a few minutes on how to measure it in vivo, so in, in mouses or in, uh, in animals, or as well as in humans. And then we'll show why it is important. So what is fluid dynamics useful for? So some clinical example of how it is useful for. And at the end, an, a, a new method, still unpublished, still submitted, how you can measure the most important part of fluid dynamics more easily in uh, clinical practice or in, in um, animal methods. So let's start. What is cardiac fluid dynamics? So why cardiac fluid dynamics? Because we have to remember that the work of the, of the heart is that of moving blood. So the, when you speak about cardiology, you speak about flow. You speak about moving blood. So it, it doesn't matter how it contracts. It's important how that contraction creates blood emotion. Sometimes, so now, now this is more or less accepted, but Sometimes the heart function is look at it, is look at as as there is no blood inside, just how it contracts, how it rotates. And, but what is important, how it rotates or how it contracts for cre for creating blood. So if you look at blood, so when I may, when I say creating flow, it means essentially creating pressure gradients that pushes the flow. So if you look at the flow, sometimes you you look at really what the function must be. So her function is about creating and sustaining blood motion. So, for example, at the early diastole, you have higher pressure in the atrium and lower pressure at the base. So the blood is pushed from the atrium inside the left ventricle. So it accelerates from the atrium inside the left ventricle. At the end of diastole, pressure is higher at the end because it is much lower in the atrium. So pressure is from the, from the apex toward the base, flow is still coming in, but it is decelerated because it, it is trying to, um, I mean, it has to decelerate until the end of diastole. And then this same sequence, so when, as an engineer, as a fluid dynamicist, I don't see that big difference between the big jump from systole on diastole because this, in this instant, that is the, the final part of diastole, the pressure gradient is from the apex toward the base. And at the beginning of systole, it is from the apex toward the base, and it's going to the exit. So for me, this is already working for ejecting the blood, because the blood is pushed from the base, from the apex toward the base. Even if it is coming in, so it is just decelerating what is coming. Then the myocardium contracted is increased more, and it goes upwards. But there is not that sharp division that from, um, from systole to diastole in the real mechanical sense, in the real in functional sense for the heart. So when you look at cardiac fluid dynamics, you have during diastole, you have a fast mitral jet that is in humans is more than one meter per second, then in a, in a fraction of a second has to turn and get out in the turn 180 degrees and get out in the opposite direction and during systole. So this is achieved, this smooth, smooth function is achieved if you have this vortex that, come, that takes blood and keeps it rotating like a, like a wheel there. And then you have the contraction must be synchronous. That doesn't mean simultaneous in all the worlds, but synchronous in a way that this rotating blood 
is pushed toward the exit in a way that you have a pressure gradient from, uh, from base to apex at the beginning and from axis to base at the end. Because you have to keep in mind that blood is an incompressible medium. So when you push an incompressible medium, when, you, when tissue is moving in, on one side, it is pushing the column of fluid on the other side. It's not like if it is empty, it's not like air. It's an incompressible medium that put, puts all the segments in touch one with the other. And why cardiac fluid dynamics? Dynamics means essentially forces that produce motion. So when you speak about cardiac fluid dynamics, it means you want to look at the forces that maintain blood in motion. Because everything that happens means um, is generated by forces. Every exchange, interaction between tissues or between tissue and blood is through forces. There are no other magic effect, just forces, exchange of forces. This is the basic of physics. So blood is ejected because there are forces created by the contracted myocardium, and then the relaxed myocardium expands because blood is pushing, making forces on the wall. So flow forces are what created and what are created by cardiac deformation. And they part we know that they participate to morphogenesis of embryonic earth. They push the, de the evolution in a proper way. And we expect that they participate also to the development of cardiac pathologies, to remodeling and the deformation of the heart. So a few words how to, uh, to measure cardiac flow in vivo. The, the most famous method, most important accurate method is uh, cardiac MRI. This is 2D and this is what is called a 4D. That is 3D plus time. This, otherwise, it is a 3D, 2D plus time. So I prefer to see, say this is a 3D, time varying 3D. This is, of course, is the best method, is the, is the, the standard method, but it is not usable for clinical team only in, uh, for research or for very specific cases. Another method is, um, is color Doppler, 2D, or reconstructing more slices, but this is limited to one direction. There are some tricks that from one direction you can reconstruct what looks like a vortex or nice, but this is not, I'm doing this, but this is not really true, so don't trust very much to this. Another method that is a bit complicated in some sense, but this more or less reliable, is uh, the echo PIV. PIV means uh, particle image velocimetry, which means you inject a, a little bit of contrast agent and you see particles moving, this particle of contrast agent, the individual bubbles moving inside the left ventricle. This is a narrow sector to have a very high frame rate. And then you can, the computer can track these bubbles and follow from one frame to the next. And so you, you can reconstruct the velocity and inside the ventricle, and then make all the quantification that you want. So that was a very high frame rate, very accurate method, but can be done also in, in more, uh, more regular acquisition. This is a normal three chamber and four chamber on the same patient. And these are the, the measurements that maybe point by point is not accurate, but if you build some average measure from everything you get, reasonable number and reproducible numbers. This just to give an idea, this is a dilated cardiomyopathy on the same patient, three chamber view and four chamber view. And you see that it, the dynamics is completely different from the other, less dynamics with a lot of rotating and stimulating blood. So now we have some basics to work with. And now I show you a very first clinical study about what to do with cardiac flow. So first of all, what we know, what we observe about flow. This is a normal patient where flow is going smoothly inside and then rotating and then ejected from the aortic valve. So this, a person with this flow is a stable physiological condition. Okay, it can stay like that forever. In terms of forces, these are called the pressure gradients. So 
you see the pressure, relative pressure, is stratified from base to apex and from apex to base, because blood is pushed from the base inside the ventricle, and then it's pushed from the ventricle towards the base. So it is normal that forces are made from base to apex and apex to base. This is a synthetic view of this moving graph. So this sort of histogram, polar histogram of the forces. So forces are mainly in this direction and in this direction. Okay? And this is normal. This is an example with apical diffraction. In this case, the flow, you can see visually that it is more irregular. There is some turbulence or some fluctuation of, uh, of pressure. If you look at pressure gradients, now they lose this base to apex stratification. It means that, the, that, that the, the tissue is contracting on one side and pushing on the other side, that is then contracting and pushing on the previous side. So it, Mm, the work of the heart is not functional to eject the blood, but its function is one contraction is just creating stress on another part of tissue and vice versa. If you look at in synthesis of forces, you see that the distribution <coughs> is no more base to apex. And of course, this is something that is not normal. So you expect that this uh, stimulates the tissue that in some, in some way that I don't know, we create a, a reaction to this abnormal working. This is an example of a, a dilated condition. You see pressure gradients are now going right, left. The ventricle is almost spherical, and the monadic forces are still irregular, and this is progressive disease, because it, it's not able to remodel in a way to re renormalize the function. What I've shown with the echo PIV was also shown in a 4D, so three-dimensional time varying uh, MRI flow measurement. This is a more recently, this is a 14 normal volunteers. These are the red is the force base to apex, and the, the error bar is the variability between the various all subjects. You see very, very stable, very reproducible measurement, and the blue is the transversal force. This is what is, happens in normals, and this is four cases in dilated cardiomyopathy. You see this pattern is completely changed. So these are, all normals are more or less like this, and any non-normal is completely different. So the, the hypothesis, the working hypothesis about flow is that you have unnatural hemodynamic forces, so non-normal, not base to apex, which means um, this is a, something that you can measure. You can directly measure with the normal method, which can be done to several causes of uh, abnormal function. And these unnatural forces are sensed at the tissue level so they, they induce a cellular response, which translates in an in a, in a adaptation of the organ, so in the remodeling. And this is something that you can, again, measure. So you have this something you can measure at the beginning, and at the end, you see another effect of this abnormality that you can measure. Let me give you a clinical verification. So that was the working hypothesis. So we, we consider, to test this hypothesis, um, heart failure patients with, with dilated cardiomyopathy, non-valvular, that were, that were implanted with a, cardiac, with a pacemaker for cardiac resynchronization therapy. And these patients were super responders. So they were with the heart, dilated heart. After, within six months, the heart went back to a normal function. So super responders, the, the CRT worked perfectly. So these patients are, are a peculiar example because when the pacemaker is on, they have a normal phase, a normal function. They are a stable condition, they will go like that forever. They work and so the, the heart is working well. But if I switch off the pacemaker in that patient, that patient is expecting in a few weeks to, 
restart remodeling and restart uh, to do it. So I can see in the same patient a stable state with the normal function and an unstable state that in, in future, in a few weeks, will remodel. So this is one case that was a high, large volume before the implant, more than 200 millimeters, low ejection fraction, and after six months, it completely renormalized it. Okay, these are the volumes, and ejection fraction is almost normal. You see with the pacemaker on, you see that pressure gradients are more or less aligned at base to apex and apex to base. If you switch off the pacemaker, in the same patient, after this happens in a few minutes, two, three minutes, you switch off the patient, you inject a little bit of contrast agent to make the flow, and you see that the function is completely changing. I mean, they, they are pressure gradient from right to left. So in synthesis, you see something like this. This is another case. You see always the same phenomenon, almost normal and completely different when you switch off the pacemaker. This is a counterexample non responder, and the, the with the pacemaker is active here, and the pacemaker is switched off here, and you see pressure gradient are always right, left, right, left. So the, the, the pacemaker was changing something because the function was different, the forces are different, but was not normalizing the forces. So it just changed the function, but was not improving at all. So the therapy was not going to normalization. And this is something that we have seen in all super responders with the pacemaker on, so the, the flow is aligned based to apex, forces are normal, and when the pacemaker is off, forces get crazy with transversal components. And the counterexample, in all known responders, the pacemaker does not, is not able to renormalize the flow, so the, the therapy didn't work. This is, in a few, is a verification in a few cases then we make a more statistical analysis. So we make 30 patients, non-ischemic, non-valvular, dilated cardiomyopathy, and we measure all the mechanical parameters that we could have with the three, from three chambers, from three slices in long axis. And from pacemaker on to pacemaker off, all parameters didn't change. Because within two, three minutes, of course, volumes are the same, ejection fraction are the same everything the same. The only thing that were different when you switch on and off the pacemaker are the standard deviation of the time to peak, so a measure of mechanical synchrony of the contraction, and the angle of these forces. So one way of measuring the angle of these forces. This is just to see if the therapy is doing something. But then we try to see which parameter correlates with the reduction of volume, so with the action of the therapy, so the, how the therapy is effective. The therapy, the CRT therapy is effective if gave a reduction of volume. So which parameter was able to correlate with the reduction of volume, you see, was only the angle, or the different of angle or the angle, absolute angle, but was only the angle of the flow was correlating with the, with the reduction of volume. So the only parameters that was able to tell that this was renormalized was the angle. All the others were still, even the standard deviation of the time to peak was not correlating at all with the effectiveness of the therapy. So these two quantities have no relation between them. One is the reduction of volume within six months. Another thing is the angle of the, of the flow. So how much the flow, only the flow is no, renormalized. And you see that the correlation is very good. I mean, different methods of measuring, different so correlation is really, really good. This is an example that I want to show because it's very instructive. There is a, an old man, 73 years old, heart failure, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, fourth class, 25% uh, and so on. And he was implanted with a CRT, quadripolar CRT, 
flow was bad before the implant. And after one month of follow-up, he had unchanged symptoms with dyspnea, still for class, the same ejection fraction, and they didn't know how to manage it. So they decided to make an acute study with flow, and so five settings, five settings of CRT, and measured the flow in all these five settings. So he was there for one hour with contrast with everything, but it was a critical patient. And then they choose the CRT setting that normalized the flow at best. After six months, he was in second class, 50% ejection fraction, and the flow was normalized. There, this team is, is doing this with several patients. When they have very critical patients, they don't know how to optimize the CRT. Few of them were in transplant list and then went out from transplant list, just doing this, this method. So I think I more or less give you a first idea that if you have a good flow alignment, so forces that are normal, are from base to up, and vice versa, it's a necessary condition for have a stable cardiac function, which means that if you have a poor flow alignment, that is enough to say this flow, this uh, function is not normal, and you will probably likely go, go to remodeling. So for many clinical indications, and so on. So I think the hemodynamic forces are known that participate to morphogenesis in burning hair. I think we have now some good basis to say that they also participate to the progression of pathologies. But they are complicated to measure, because you need contrast agent, you need um, some expertise to do that. So we try to develop a different method to measure just the hemodynamic force. I mean, we have been working on flow in the heart since probably 15 years now, and it takes several years to understand we, what we have to look at. Now the story has been shrinked in 10 minutes, but it took years. Now that we understood that we have to focus on hemodynamic force as something that is reproducible, easy to measure, and, and so on, so now we are thinking of method to measure this hemodynamic force in a more straightforward way. So why this? Because hemodynamic force are mainly I mean, they depend also on the vortex, but the main, I mean, 90% say of those are due to the, how much the, the tissue is moving and how much momentum is transferred across the valves. So in principle, you can estimate the hemodynamic force just from the information on tissue motion and on how much flow is entering in and exiting from the flow, which means from speckle track that are tissue information from the tissue. It, there is some mathematical complicated model, but this is what I do, <laughs> so don't, don't worry. So, but behind this is, is an important work. And after this model, we validated this technique with the 4D MRI flow. This is just submitted. So these are uh, 10 patients from uh, Normals, athletes, dilated cardiomyopathy. One patient has a 600 milliliters of, um, of the left ventricle. So very um, variable cases. And you see that the dots, these are the time course. This is time, and these are the forces. The dots are the measurement by 4D MRI, and the line is measured by this model. And you see that it is very good. This is for base to apex force that is the most important, and this is for the transversal force. That is less accurate, but still, but this is point by point uh, comparison. This is the uh, root mean square comparison, and you see the, I mean the, the correlation is very good, and the, cor the best fit is the, the model is equal to the, to the MRI, so the one coefficient and no and no, um, so, so this is a very good agreement. So after this, we can say that if I have something like this, no, why? If I have something like this, that is normal that you now start to have with the uh, speckle tracking, from this, you can get 
the geometric valuation, so you know the volumes, the, eject the ejection fraction, the longitudinal strain, but from the same information, now you can also evaluate the hemodynamic forces. So this is from forces from base the up to apex, this is the systole, this is the diastolic suction, and this is the diastole and so on. This is in, in a normal, but I have to come here, so I, I took all the images that I had, I could find about mice. And this is a normal mice. This is what you do with the visual sonics. And this is what you measure normally. Now, what I used was not the visual sonics, it was mice also, so I have not enough decimals. But and then this is normal information, but from the same image, I can calculate the volume, and we know we can calculate the G global longitudinal strain, also the circumferential strain, and you can calculate what is the flow force in these mice, assuming that it is circular, of course. I, I was just using one slice, so I, I'm assuming that, that I could reproduce the, all the slices with the same one. So I have these new information that are the flow forces. And I, in, if I have a normal and infarcted rat and an infarcted rat at time zero, this is af just after ligation, this is after I don't know how many days. These are all the images that I had in my PC. So, so this is what you do now. Now you have ejection fraction or volumes or GLS. But on, on the same, these are the volume curves. And this is the dilated and this is normal and infarcted, the red one. And these are the forces. So I don't go into the taste now because I, I mean these are these, these two are the same, but these are not related. It's not, but just to give you an idea that I can calculate from the speckle tracking, I can calculate also the forces. And forces give a completely different and new information about the heart function. So I think that I try to convince you that fluid dynamics is an important point of cardiac function. It's not just deformation imaging. It, deformation is for making blood motion. So, so I think that to understand better the dynamic function, we have to look at fluid dynamics and probably hemodynamic force is the easiest way. The first thing to look at is that now hemodynamic forces can be, be estimated by the regular echocardiography. So you, with this, you can go, you have a completely new, a completely independent new measurement, global measurement about uh, physiological function can be useful for your research. Thank you very much.